Um, the second award tonight is the Institute's Outstanding Contributions Award for 2022. Um, that award is for prominent, distinguished and exceptional service in the field of insolvency. Um, over the last five years, the awardees have been David Richards, Christoph Paulos, Jim Peck, Michael Crystal, Alan Gropper. Um, the 2022 award is to Dan Glossband. Um, and to present the award, who is also a past recipient of the award, I would invite Jay Westbrook to the podium. Well, thank you, John, very much. It's, it's an extraordinary honor and privilege for me to uh, present this award to my dear friend, Don Glassman. Don, Dan, come, come, come up here, Dan, and take it like a man. Come on. <laughs> Dan is a remarkable guy who's done a lot of amazing things. Of course, a partner at Goodwin Proctor for many years. And he's a recipient of so many awards, I could keep us here quite a long time talking about all of those awards and honors. But there's a few I wanna talk about in particular that relate to our institute. Um, so I'm gonna to have to limit myself to an hour or so, maybe a little less, uh, to try to even begin to talk about all the things that Dan has done. Dan is a pioneer. You should understand that he began working on international insolvency matters back in the 70s when most bankruptcy lawyers in the US and elsewhere couldn't spell international insolvency. He was there at the very start. He was active on committee, committee J of the IBA. Of the, uh, he was chair of its insolvency subcommittee. And the IBA's role in the early years of cross-national insolvency was enormously important. I'll talk about that more in a minute. He was an active advisor to our project at the American Law Institute, the Transnational Insolvency Project, which was ALI's first venture into insolvency law. For a number of years, he was chair of the International Bankruptcy Committee of the National Bankruptcy Conference. He's been a regent and vice president of the American College of Bankruptcy, and endless and numerous citations in best lawyers in the United States, best lawyers in Massachusetts, and so forth. Um, He's also taught cross-border insolvency law at Columbia and NYU. But above all, for all of us, he was one of the founders, one of the important founders of this institute. And so therefore, it's especially appropriate that we honor him tonight. But I must say, from my point of view, maybe of all the marvelous things that Dan has done, the most important and crucial was his central law, uh, role in the making of the model law, 25 years of which we celebrate at this meeting. Um, he and I became close friendship, friends and colleagues during the two and a half years that the model law was developed. Um, at that time, as I mentioned earlier today, it was two weeks at a time, boy. Uh, <laughs> That was quite a, an effort. And so we had an opportunity to become very close friends and I had an opportunity to learn so much from him about the insolvency project. Um, the, he represented the IBA, the International Bar Association, which was a very important NGO in balancing the, all these government delegations that had come to UNCITRAL for the first insolvency project that UNCITRAL had ever attempted its role, specifically Dan's role, was crucially important. Among many negotiations and interventions, I have to remember particularly that he was the best legislative draftsman I have ever known. As lawyers know, that kind of drafting of ineffective statutes, which of course became the model law, is very difficult, it's very tricky, it's very hard to think of all the things to consider. Um, Few people have the knack to do that. Well, 
whenever we had our main session, at, I assume it's still the same way today, when we had our main session at Unsatral in the big hall with all of the interventions and all of that, we then would retire at the end of the day. Those of us who had some energy and concern left would meet in a small drafting group. Our small drafting group always included representatives of all five of the permanent members of the Security Council and a number of other delegations as well. And it was there that we took the Secretariat's rendition of what we had agreed to during the day and began to turn it into the five official languages of the UN. That's an enormously difficult and sensitive topic. And, and, and Dan had the knack of going back and forth and finding the substantive answer to whatever objections were being raised by various delegations and then turning his solution into legislative language that we could accept in five different languages. It was an extraordinary achievement. I've never seen anything quite like it. It was watching a lawyer artist at work. No one was more important to the achievement of the model law. It is my great pleasure to present the Institute's Outstanding Contributor Award to Daniel Fosspine. Thanks, buddy. Please. I get the same seven minutes as Tom, but my seven minutes might be closer to seven minutes. Um, I, but, and I want to start by congratulating him for receiving the Founders Award. I've known Tom for more than 20 years. I've admired him. I like him. I was the chair of the American College of Bankruptcy's International Nominating Committee when Tom became a fellow in 2003, so I did my best to advance his career a little bit, but he didn't need much help. When I saw Thomas last year, um, he told me he was thinking about retiring. Um, I spoke to him earlier this week, and he's making major progress. He said he's cutting back to six days a week. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I'm very honored uh, to have been chosen to receive this award. I appreciate it. Thank my friend Jay for his remarks, even though there was a fair amount of hyperbole in there. And um, I also consider myself fortunate to know and have worked with all of the other prior recipients of this award. And um, while they pretty clearly deserve to be in the Pantheon, I'm a little insecure about trying to see myself at their level. Um, I'll give you a brief, brief history lesson. Um, I could not have predicted when I started practicing law that I would be an insolvency lawyer. I was hired to do securities work, and when I arrived at work, the market was about to tank. And they didn't need securities lawyers, but they needed bankruptcy lawyers. And I got shuttled to a place where there was actual business. Um, I also couldn't have predicted that I was going to wind up being involved in international insolvency matters. When I began to work in 1969, there was no bankruptcy code. There was the Bankruptcy Act of 1898 and the Chandler Act amendments that added reorganization provisions in 1938. There were no rules of bankruptcy procedure. Congress authorized the Supreme Court to promulgate rules in 1964, but they didn't go into effect until 1973. So things were a little more primitive. There were no bankruptcy judges. There were referees in bankruptcy. The 1973 rules finally elevated their denomination to bankruptcy judge. Some of the referees that I practiced before were part-time, and I remember a hearing in New Hampshire when the referee adjourned the hearing to go across the street and meet with the divorce client. So there was no FedEx in those days. There were no personal computers. Xerox machines were just beginning to replace wet copy machines. There was a lot of whiteout. There was a lot of carbon paper, and even that had strategic implications. The, the ribbon copy of the pleading went to the court. The most faded last copy of the carbon went to your adversary. And in that context, there were very few international implications 
to the practice of bankruptcy law. Most cases did not even have a foreign creditor. I got my first international case a little later than Jay attributed it to in, in 1983, at least the first significant one. The um, Canadian Atlantic fishing industry was in trouble. They had excess plant capacity, they had declining fish stocks, there was a recession, and there were a lot of bankruptcies. The Canadian government was trying to consolidate and restructure the principal fishing companies. In part, they tried to do that by forcing exchanges of debt for equity. So the company owners were going to be severely diluted. To gain a negotiating advantage in that situation, one of the fishing companies filed a Chapter 11 case in the US where it had a plant and it tried to get in the way of the receiver who was implementing the restructuring. I got hired by that receiver. And um, I learned at that point that nobody knew anything about international insolvency. I mean, nobody. And um, I also decided it was a pretty interesting area. And so I just kind of got caught up and I followed that interest into uh, becoming inter active in the International Bar Association. I was active in Committee J, which was the Insolvency Committee. And that's where I actually met a number of people um, who are members of this institute. Richard Gitlin was the chairman, I think, when I started being active. He was followed by John Barrett. I think they've all received awards here. Um, Bruce Leonard followed John Barrett, and Richard Brody followed Bruce Leonard. At the same time, because I knew a little bit, I started to get Section 304 cases. Section 304 was the predecessor to Chapter 15. When Bruce Leonard's term as the chairman of Committee J ended, um, he wasn't happy about it, and he began looking for another organization that he could lead. And he asked me, and I'm sure he asked others in the room, what do you think about starting an international equivalent of the American College of Bankruptcy? And the rest, as they say, is, uh, is history. That became this organization. Um, along the way, in 1994, um, I was invited to a colloquium that Insol and Unsetral sponsored that was to consider whether there was room to find a legislative improvement in international insolvency law. In 1995, at a then UNSA meeting to follow up on the colloquium, as Jay discussed earlier today, um, the group finally decided that a model law was the best vehicle to try to improve international insolvency. It became the legal instrument that um, they decided um, that they were going to adopt. They delegated that project to an insolvency working group, working group five, and I became the International Bar Association's lead delegate to working group five. What that turned into was pretty much two years spent with Jay and others, um, working, first listening to the, what's the connect word, the, the, the unconnected, disconnected ramblings of the group. We had a large group of people in a large conference room with circular tables, some of whom knew what they were talking about, others didn't, but it didn't stop them. And so you'd have a very non-linear discussion, and at the end of the day, we'd come back and try to assimilate that into something that made sense. Jay was the head of the US delegation, I was the head of the IBA delegation, and then there were representatives of some of the major countries, including those on the Security Council. And we spent all of our time at coffee breaks, at lunches, after the meetings and at some special sessions, um, turning everything that we heard into something that made sense and could be used um, legislatively. Well, now you know that it worked. In May 1997, UNCITRAL and then the General Assembly adopted the model law. That timing was auspicious because there was a National Bankruptcy Review Commission in the United States that was created in 1994. It was finishing its work and it had heard about the model law. It invited us to make a presentation. We did. They liked what they heard. They suggested that we try to adapt 
we being a large group consisting of Jay and I, um, try to adapt that model law for US um, adoption. The US State Department organized a small group that consisted of representatives of the Justice Department, the Commerce Department, United States Trustee's Office, and a representative of State's Attorneys General. The two of us, Judge Lifflin, and maybe one or two others that I've forgotten, we um, were very efficient. We finished our work, you know, in, I would say, under a year. But then it sat frozen because Congress was in the midst of um, haggling with the consumer credit industry over consumer bankruptcy issues. Um, that exercise culminated in what I would say was a deceptively named statute called the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act. And instead, it was an act that preyed on consumers to try to squeeze a few more basis points out for the, um, the credit industry. But they finally agreed on things. And at that, that point, Chapter 15, which had been sitting quietly in a corner, was hooked onto the train and basically left the station with, um, with that legislation. So that's kind of a brief history. Um, I enjoyed the whole thing. I think Jay enjoyed the whole thing. I enjoyed Jay. Um, I'm grateful that I'm, uh, I'm a survivor. I mean, I'm still at this. I still like it. I don't take direct client work anymore, but I, I advise and I do a lot of expert testimony. I've developed, developed a huge number of friendships with uh, many of you among others. And I'm especially grateful to the III for the recognition that this award reflects. So thank you all again. I appreciate it very much. That brings the formalities uh, for this evening to an end. Um, I should just mention that, Shari will correct me if I've got the times wrong, there'll be breakfast from 7.30 tomorrow and the members' annual meeting will commence at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. So thank you very much for your attendance and um, thank you for the, to the conference committee and to Shari for the organisation of this event tonight.